All right, good morning. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the department. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Grand Rounds this morning. We have another extraordinary speaker. We've been on quite a roll this new year with wonderful faculty, especially new faculty uh, to the department um, and as either primary or courtesy appointments. But as always, we'll start with the land acknowledgement shown here. Um, and then also some of the housekeeping related to CME and MOC credit. And that information also for the folks that are online um, is put into the chat. And I'll tell you in a moment about Dr. Cardenas, but before that, I wanna bring your attention to the upcoming speakers. These are actually two really extraordinary events. Uh, Greg Armstrong and I go way back. He has the MSCE degree, the same one I have from the University of Pennsylvania and known him since he was a trainee and so thrilled with really the remarkable work that he's doing on survivorship now on the faculty at St. Jude's. And we're so excited about hosting him here next week. And then our health equity round, incredibly important round, which has been really just a wonderful partnership. And we'll be hearing from Barack or Rebecca, who really helped spearhead this whole idea of health equity rounds and then admit. Um, so great, really great upcoming uh, pediatric grand rounds. So look forward to seeing you there. Um, and then it's also that time where we're gearing up for the 14th annual pediatrics research retreat. It was so thrilling to all be together last year. This is a really wonderful event, especially for our trainees, our residents, our fellows, our postdocs, and a chance to meet some of our new faculty. So please uh, make a note of the abstract deadline of Sunday, uh, this Sunday, um, as well as just the date, saving the date itself, which it'll be over at Li Kaxing. And then MCC POP, I had to look it up to remember, it's the Mid-Coastal California Perinatal Outreach Program, which is here in the, centered in the Department of Pediatrics. And I just wanna call your attention to the topics. Uh, very importantly, we're gonna be addressing racial disparities in maternal health, as well as some of the other important um, topics shown here. Um, and with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome this morning's Pediatric Grand Round speaker, Dr. Andres Cardenas. So um, Dr. Cardenas um, responded to one of our searches in general pediatrics. So I heard him speak and they were in the middle of the search. And I was like, time out. We're going to pull you out of the search and we're going to figure out a way to get you here. Quite hair on fire emergency uh, just right before the holidays last year. And um, you know, reached out to Melissa Bondi, the chair of the Department of Epidemiology, David Rakoff, who you heard from a few weeks ago, heard from here. And it was absolutely just one of the most important, wonderful things we've had to do together, been able to do together with the Department of Epidemiology to get you here. So welcome. Um, and he will have a courtesy appointment in the Department of Pediatrics. And I'll think you, I think you'll see why in that his um, really innovative epigenetics research is incredibly relevant to child health. So uh, very briefly, he's an environmental molecular epidemiologist with a very strong biologic, quantitative, and methodologic background. His research focuses on identifying epigenetic and molecular targets of environmental exposures and their role in the developmental origins of health and disease, and focuses on understanding the cumulative toll of early life environment and impact throughout the life course. And when we heard from David just a couple of weeks ago, it was also the life course approach. Um, crosses many different domains. This is what makes it so exciting and innovative, both in epidemiology, epigenetics, environmental health. Um, and more recently, he's become interested in the intersection of social and chemical exposures and the role of social adversity, adversity and racism on disease risk. So I'm sure I could tell you much more about his work, but I think I'll let you do that. And with that, uh, welcome. Delighted to have you here this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And yeah, I'm standing here today because of Dr. Leonard, and I'm so glad uh, things worked out. Uh, and I'm happy to be connected to pediatrics as well, although I'm housed in epidemiology. I'm always looking for trainees and fellows and anyone that wants to work on uh, research with me, feel free to reach out. Uh, so today I'll be talking about environmental epigenetics, and perhaps this might be a new concept to you. Some of you might have heard of epigenetics and how this applies to children's health. And I'll go over some of my research as well. So what I'm hoping to accomplish today is to really define epigenetics for you. Uh, so we all leave the room with a working understanding of what epigenetics is and what epigenetics is not. Um, I'll try to motivate this in the field of um, pediatric um, uh, research, thinking about fetal epigenetic programming. And this is one of the concepts that really got me interested in the field. I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, one related to prenatal smoking and how that might program placental methylation and how it's related to things like birth weight that we care about. 
The other one is related to more respiratory and allergic disease, looking at the nasal methylum. So we're really excited about this new tissue that, of course, a lot of people have been thinking about nasal samples since COVID, but something novel that we have been collecting as well and how it relates to um, respiratory and allergic disease. And finally, I'll talk about aging, and you might be wondering why are you talking about aging in a pediatrics uh, ground rounds, but I think we've been trying to frame that aging is really um, starts taking a conception, right? So once you are conceived and, and born, that uh, aging trajectory is set very early on, and this is something that we're really interested in. Uh, my work encompasses epidemiology. We also use epigenomic tools as well as big data and uh, machine learning tools to look at how the environment affects our health and disease throughout the life course. And then I'll end with some take home points um, that I hope is emphasized throughout the presentation. So what is epigenetics? So epi comes from the Greek, literally means above or upon genetics. So these are changes that are on top of the genetic code. These changes um, uh, are changes in gene expressions that are not dependent on the genetic code. So you're altering the expression of genes but are altering the genetic sequence, and this is key. These changes are also stable. So this is what makes it very attractive as a biomarker compared to say uh, transcription or RNA, that RNA is less stable. So these changes are fairly stable once they happen. They might also persist mythotically. And when I say persist, they persist from one cell division to another. There's some debate. If you talk to individuals doing research with nematodes like worms and plants, there's pretty clear evidence that go from one generation to another. But in mammals and humans, that's debated. Uh, so there's quite a bit of debate there. And that actually goes against the idea of evolution that you can pass down information from one generation to another through epigenetic marks. So still highly debatable. There's not enough data or evidence just yet. So if you take anything from today's talk, I want you to know that epigenetic marks are tissue and cell type specific. So if you think about all the cells in your body, right? So your brain cells or your heart cells, they look very different and they have very different functions, yet they have exactly the same genome for all practical purposes, right? So the DNA code is the same. So how are two cells that do and act very differently um, achieve this? And one process is through epigenetic programming. So very early on, once the zygote is formed and there's pluripotent stem cells and some of the stem cells that are gonna become different types of cells and tissues, there's a process of epigenetic reprogramming that happens to form the different um, layers like the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm, and even the germ cell layers that are, uh, these cells commit to become this type of cells and commit to being this type of tissue very early on. And this is through epigenetic programming. So you go from having the same genome, even within the same organism, as to having um, different cell functions and different cell types through epigenetic programming. So epigenetics contributes to tissue differentiation and cell type um, fate differentiation as well. So hypothetically, each cell type, within each cell type, there's a unique epigenetic signature, which as you can imagine is a huge um, challenge for us doing research and also um, holds a lot of promise as well. So the NIH has realized the promises of the epigenome and um, they have invested heavily in trying to characterize the epigenome. This is very similar to like the human genome project to try to code the entire human genome. Uh, the epigenome is a little more tricky. Right now we're up to about 111 um, human epigenomes, uh, whether those are cells or tissue types, it varies a little bit. Once we start digging into cell types, right, as some of you have taken immunology, I'm sure there's multiple cell types within each cell type. There's uh, sub-cell types as well. But what I want you to know relevant to us is that there's also the fetal epigenome and the child epigenome, and they differentiate between adult and, and fetal tissue. And the reason being, although this can be the same uh, individual, their epigenomes are gonna be pretty different even for say a, a simple or you know one, structure like the brain, the epigenome of adults or the same individual is gonna look different than the epigenome of the brain of the child uh, of the same individual when, when they were a, a fetus or they were a child. So this drives the point home that uh, there's a, a component of time. So the passage of time gets recorded through the epigenome. Of course, it has to do with development and maturation as well. Um, but that holds a lot of promise to me in terms of uh, trying to optimize health, uh, health outcomes very early on, identifying biomarkers as well. But at least now we have some sort of what a healthy epigenome might look like. Uh, we're not there yet. We don't have like gold standard references, but we're beginning to understand what normal and abnormal looks like for epigenomes. 
Um, I'm going to talk about mainly about methylation of DNA due to time, and this is what I think is ready for prime time, and there's some clinical applications to methylation measurements of DNA. These other measurements like histone modifications and non-coding RNAs are also considered epigenetic modifications, but we're not just there yet uh, to try to translate this, and even for population studies. So when I'm talking about methylation of DNA, I'll be mainly referring to methylation of cytosine molecules. So this is your uh, one of your uh, nucleotides, uh, one of the base pairs of, of, of DNA, the cytosine, um, can become methylated at the five prime position of this ring by the addition of this uh, small metal group to it. And then once you look at it, it's still a cytosine. It remains as a cytosine, but it now has this tiny metal group attached to this position here in the ring. Um, and that's an epigenetic modification. Histones are the protein complexes where DNA can actually wrap around and you can block transcription, for example, if the DNA is tightly packed, as you see here, uh, uh, the target gene is not transcribed. And then non-coding RNAs can interfere um, uh, with transcription and translation in several ways, but for example, microRNAs can bind uh, to either stabilize or destabilize uh, translation of the protein. Um, so these are three examples of epigenetic modifications. Uh, I would say the most widely studied is methylation of DNA that we can actually study it at a single base resolution in the genome. And I'll show you how we do that. So why methylation of DNA? Why do we care about DNA methylation? So DNA methylation is thought to be a molecular switch. So then again, here you have your cytosine. It undergoes methylation by the addition of this methyl group. And here we have SAMI, which is one of the methyl donors, uh, can donate this methyl group. Um, and there's a specific set of enzymes, for example, DNA methyl transferases that can actually steal that methyl group from SAMI and donate it to the cytosine. So that's really important for epigenomic maintenance uh, of our genomes. So one of the first realizations in the field is that this uh, CG dinucleotide, so a, a cytosine followed by a guanine, don't occur at random. So there's these clusters, and oftentimes they occur upstream of genes. So here you have your gene, your favorite gene, and you have what I'm calling a CPG island, which are CG dense regions. So these are CG dinucleotides that are pretty dense upstream of the genes. And if this CPG island is not methylated, represented here by this lollipop, so these are just regular cytosines, phyllobiguanines, gene expression can occur. And then if it's heavily methylated, gene expression is repressed. So now you have a really elegant switch. And you know this is not an all or nothing event. This is more of a you know, volume that you can actually regulate expression to a certain extent. So remember, this is not a binary outcome. Uh, we're looking at degrees of methylation. So you can methylate some cells and demethylate some other cells at a specific genes, and then uh, gene expression might be regulated that way. So the whole premise here is that we have now have several examples uh, where methylation differs between disease and uh, healthy state, uh, whether it's tissue or conditions. Um, so the whole hypothesis is that methylation of DNA might be responsive to environmental conditions because it's malleable uh, and might be responsible for health and disease risk throughout the life course. So this is one of the reasons I became so interested in uh, methylation of DNA. So there's this process of fetal epigenetic reprogramming that happens early um, during uh, fetal development. So here on the y-axis, you have the degree of uh, methylation. And then on the x-axis, you have the process of development. So very early on, um, the sperm and the egg have some degree of methylation. Uh, upon formation of the zygote and fertilization, what happens is that methylation gets erased for the most part out of the entire genome. So it's kind of resetting the program. You're erasing uh, all the methylation mark across the chromosomes with an exception of a few imprinted genes. And I'm sure most of you know about imprinted disorders, right, where there's methylation either on the paternal or the maternal side of, of the genome. And if there's aberrant methylation, maybe the two genes are heavily methylated and therefore silenced, or maybe they're not methylated, this is my occur. But this is the exception. For the most part, the entire genome gets demethylated and then there's the remethylation event uh, where the cells are being programmed uh, to become specific cells and they go to foreign somatic tissues and so on. So to me, this is a very critical window uh, of development, right? This is where there's a high demand for metal donors like folate. Uh, this is why one of the reasons why folate is important during fetal development. But because I'm in public health, I'm really interested in uh, prevention at the population level. 
And particularly when we study chemicals, uh, we think about setting standards for regulation. And I think we should be looking at this because hypothetically here, we might be able to protect three generations if we set standards uh, based on uh, this critical window. We have the F0 generation, the F1 and the F2, with the germ cells as well that we can protect um, very early on. So this is key in terms of epigenetic programming. And we study a lot of exposures during pregnancy and then follow children throughout life in a few cohorts to try to understand what are the implications of exposures? What are the implications to child health and development later in life? So I wanted to present a, a little bit of an older uh, study, but I think this study is an experimental study that really shows nicely what, um, what might be happening uh, here. Um, in terms of epigenetic programming. So this is the Goody Mouse model. There's uh, this regular uh, variation in code color, but most of the Goody Mouse are this pseudo Goody color or heavily model uh, mice, so more of a brown color. Um, once in a while from a litter, you get this yellow uh, Goody, uh, Goody Mouse. Uh, there's natural variation, but uh, in this experiment, um, mice that were uh, exposed in utero, so this is a litter that was exposed in utero, with increase in BPA, you get a higher uh, frequency of offspring that had this slightly model or yellow phenotype. Um, and BPA is a plasticizer that was put in bottles. Now it has been phased out mostly and replaced by BPS. And BPS has, BPS has a shorter half-life in the body, so we excrete it quickly, quicker, but yet there's still endocrine access to it. That's a side story, but you probably have seen a lot of the plastic bottles that say BPA-free uh, for multiple reasons, but... Uh, here, this is an early paper, 2007, showing uh, effects at a specific uh, phenotype like code color that is so visible. Uh, what they were able to show in here is that the Agouti uh, gene was actually demethylated among exposed uh, offspring that uh, moms that were exposed to BPA in their diet compared to animals that were in the control diet where there was no BPA. And why does it matter? Well, of course, code color is, is very visible, but the this uh, more rare yellow or slightly model uh, goody mouse tends to resemble insulin resistant phenotypes. So basically they're more prone to obesity and to develop insulin resistance compared to the pseudo goody mouse um, that is uh, more frequent in the population. So here you have a prenatal exposure, which is BPA, a plasticizer, a known endocrine disruptor, altering methylation mark or a specific locus that controls good color. Uh, that leads to potentially a phenotype that might resemble uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. So to me, this is a pretty good example of how a prenatal exposure might program uh, the offspring uh, health and development. So how do we do this in human studies? So we know that we're exposed to multiple chemicals uh, and stressors where there are social chemical stressors. That leads to an internal dose, for example, lead. We know that lead crosses the, uh, the placenta. It also goes in, crosses the blood brain barrier as well. So the question becomes, what we try to do in our work is to try to answer the question whether that influences the epigenome. And as I mentioned, there's multiple epigenomes, so that becomes a big uh, question. And then whether these epigenetic modifications, you know, okay, well, methylation changes, does it matter? Does it affect newborn health? And you know things like birth weight and gestational age. But why do we care about those things? Is because we are really thinking about life course health, disease risk um, from an early life exposure. I am missing a very important piece here, and I personally feel responsible for kind of contributing to more of the maternal health research. But yet we don't include parents, right, or or the paternal side. Um, so. The reason being is because it's fairly difficult to catch uh, couples prior to conception, although there's a few studies that are trying to do this. I work with a few colleagues that are trying to uh, look into IBF cohorts, for example. So these are couples' preconceptions. So there's now mounting evidence that also the paternal epigenome, I just told you everything gets erased and reestablished. That was a very broad stroke of saying epigenetic reprogramming. There's some evidence that some genes including some of the imprinted genes might be passed on to, uh, to, to the offspring later down the line. So it's not that, you know, the lack of data is perhaps like design because we have mostly designed uh, cohort studies follow uh, pregnant uh, people and not uh, the contribution of the paternal line. Okay, so how do we do this in humans, right? So in the example of the Agouti mouse, uh, they looked at the Agouti gene, that makes sense, right? That gene was known to control the color. But how do we do this in humans? You know, we go gene by gene, and that's actually what people did very early on, very similar to genetics. 
Uh, for example, people kept studying P53 because P53 controls cell cycle and other things, but um, that becomes an unscalable thing, right? Where you're testing gene by gene and there are thousands of genes and each gene might be mapped to hundreds, if not thousands of individual uh, cytosines. Um, so that's what we did very early on. But luckily enough, biotechnology caught up uh, and sequencing technologies as well. Uh, one tool that we have now is this high density microarrays, very similar to genotyping the arrays. So if some of you have done some of the genotyping commercial available kits, this is basically what they're doing. These microarrays are able to uh, survey the genome, um, not entirely, but pretty, pretty well for CPGs. We're getting close to almost a million CPG sites. The latest iteration of this microarray is getting close to 950,000 individual CPG sites. And it has pretty good coverage. It covers a lot of the genes in the RevSeq uh, genome. Um, and it does it at a single nucleotide resolution. So you know, for this specific CPG, what is the degree of methylation and where in the genome is that located? So you actually get a uh, location. We perform these hypothesis-free epigenome-wide association studies. Um, very similar to GWAS, where there's genome-wide association studies for uh, SNPs what we call these EWAS, which are epigenome-wide association studies. The data is very high dimensional, right? So for every single individual, we get about a, a million data points. Um, so the number of parameters is huge, and we run into bioinformatics and methodological issues. So there's a lot of work on that side into the methodology that I won't be going over today. So I wanted to give you an example as it relates to, to child health. And uh, here we looked at prenatal smoking and placental methylation. So I'm on purpose, not trying to show you some of the um, blood findings. Very early on, people were studying met methylomes of leukocytes because everyone collected leukocytes for DNA sequencing or DNA genotyping. So that was really available. But then with epigenetics, we realized that tissue matters a lot, So right? So we had to design new studies to collect novel tissues. And in this case, the, the human placenta. So I don't have to convince you that uh, studying smoking is, is very important uh, clinically and also for public health. So smoking causes low birth weight. It also reduces fetal growth. Um, in the US, there's quite a bit of variation. The prevalence is about 5% of pregnant people reported smoking during pregnancy, but there's quite a bit of status uh, variation as high as 25% uh, in West Virginia. And California is doing pretty good. We're getting close to only 1% of pregnant people reported smoking during pregnancy. So, so why do we study the placenta? Well, the placenta is the master regulator of the fetal environment. It allows for waste and nutrient exchange. It also has endocrine functions. So it produces hormones, um, it communicates with the maternal and fetal side. So in this study, this is what a prospective birth cohort um, called Gen3G uh, from Cherbrooke, Canada. We recruited 441 uh, mother-child pairs. They self-reported smoking during pregnancy and we collected placentas at birth. Uh, we query the epigenome of the, the placenta using this microarrays that interrogate over 700,000 individual CPG sites. Uh, the cohort was generally healthy. The only thing that I wanted to highlight here is that only 38 moms reported smoking during pregnancy. Uh, that's a little bit higher than the prevalence in the U.S., I guess, the, the average prevalence, but 8.6%. Um, and you'll see that, you know, although the sample size is relatively small for some of the genomic analysis that we do, uh, we were still having power enough, to, uh, statistical power, to be able to uh, detect associations. So this is the framework that we were working under. First, you know, we did confirm that um, pregnant people that smoked during pregnancy had babies that were on average 175 grams smaller, newborns, uh, compared to non-smoking uh, pregnant people. Um, the question that we wanted to ask is whether smoking influences methylation of the placenta, right? So those methyl marks, or whether they're altered by smoking prenatally, whether those methylation marks actually predict birth weight, you know, are they related to um, uh, birth weight? And then the, the, the real question that we're trying to ask is whether the amount of the effect out of 175 grams, that's an estimate, how much is it going through methylation of the placenta? Is there any evidence that some of the effect is actually mediated through placental methylation? So we perform a statistical mediation analysis. We perform an EWAS here, an EWAS here, and then finally we perform a statistical mediation analysis to, to look for evidence or not of uh, statistical mediation. So I wanted to show you the impact of smoking on the placental epigenome. This was one of the first few studies to look at this question. It has been looked at blood and leukocyte core blood before. Um, 
what we were able to document is that the smoking uh, effect on the epigenome of the placenta is widespread across pretty much every single chromosome. This is a Manhattan plot. If you're not familiar with this, this is the negative log of the p-value. Every single data point is as individual CPG site, and this is mapped to uh, the 22 chromosomes. Uh, we excluded the, the sex chromosomes. Um, so what we see here is that every single um, chromosome in the placenta is being affected by smoking. Uh, this is a volcano plot. Uh, here on the x-axis, you have the effect size, and then on the y-axis, you have the negative log of the p-value. So these are very significant results, you know, 10 to a negative 30. Um, and then a 30% decrease in methylation for smokers. The other point that I wanted to make is that, for example, this LHKR1 uh, gene that is differentially methylated, the signal is so strong that you are actually able to classify people that smoke and that didn't smoke during pregnancy just by looking at the methylation marks with pretty high accuracy. Uh, and I'll show you some AUC curves that I think I included here as well. So the effect sizes are strong and they're widespread throughout the epigenome of the placenta. Uh, this is somewhat of a busy table. This is the CPG ID, the chromosome, the position within the genome and the specific gene. This is the effect size that is direct. So this is the direct effect size of smoking during pregnancy and birth weight. And this is the mediated effect. So this is the pathway, the indirect pathway that we're trying to characterize. We found uh, pretty strong evidence among seven CPG sites that map to different genes, including some of the SIP. Um, I'm sure you have heard of some of the, some of the SIP genes that uh, metabolize exogenous exposures. But I particularly what caught my eye was this PVX1 gene that had pretty strong effect size, 168 grams, that was mediated through that specific pathway, um, going through from smoking to lower birth weight, specifically through the methylation of the PVX1 gene. Uh, and then some of the effect sizes were a little smaller, like 88 grams. Um, we did test for exposure mediator interactions, so this is more of a technicality, but we proposed that the level of methylation that you start with, so how much methylation the placenta had to begin with, or you know, at conception or formation, influences whether smoking has an effect on birth weight or not. That's what this interaction test is telling you, and we found some evidence of that. Uh, but the effect sizes were, were quite strong. Um, I won't go too much into detail, but uh, we did find that the placenta was very sensitive, as you saw across all the chromosomes, to maternal smoking. Uh, we found evidence of mediation uh, uh, with a specific set of genes. Uh, this PVX1 gene, I, you know, I didn't know that it existed, of course, before doing this, because this is untargeted. Uh, but after doing uh, more of a literature search, uh, PVX1 seems to regulate osteogenesis and skeletal pattern in rhymes of bone formation. And we also found one other study where PVX1 uh, in core blood was associated with birth weight. Uh, so that was more evidence that this might be causative on that pathway. And then we proposed this exposure mediator interaction that was highly relevant for epigenetic epidemiology. Uh, and this has been done for core blood. Um, the signatures appear to be different. So this is uh, highlighting the relevance of studying different tissues as well. So I want to briefly mention that the evidence is mounting now. Um, exactly what we're trying to do is trying to investigate that indirect pathway. Of course, all of these studies with maternal smoking is observational studies because you cannot do a randomized trial, of course. Uh, but no one argues that um, this is not causal. Um, there's now more evidence. For example, uh, we investigated birth weight, but uh, people have done studies looking at schizophrenia, asthma, ADHD, um, mediated through uh, either placental methylation and core blood. You can see these are some of the core blood studies. This is a review. And these are some of the other studies that have looked at um, core blood or placenta and different biomarkers like cortisol or different outcomes like ADHD or schizophrenia uh, as well. So there's mounting evidence that there might be a causal role of uh, the methylation influencing health and disease trajectories. So these are the AUC curves that I promised to show you. So the, the signature is so strong, even in a small sample size that you're able, this is core blood. So using the methylation marks associated with smoking, you're able to classify smokers and non-smokers. Well, you know, there's other biomarkers to measure smoking. So maybe this is not so exciting, but this is a proof of principle. The other thing that really struck me, this is a study that looked at, um, the methylome in leukocytes, so blood drawn 30 years later. So these are adults in their 30s. And they ask the question, can we actually predict whether um, the, uh, the mom smoked during pregnancy uh, with an AUC of about 0.72? So this is looking when you're an adult 
trying to predict whether you might smoke during pregnancy. And this is, they also try adjusted for uh, environmental tobacco smoke and also on um, their own personal risk of smoking as well. So I think this is a proof of principle. As the biomarkers keep getting better and our technology keeps getting better, I think we're gonna be able to predict more exposures. Uh, now we have biomarkers for alcohol consumption. We have biomarkers for environmental exposures. We've been trying to build some biomarkers for air pollution as well. Uh, so in the future, this is you know not ready for prime time, but I do think as the technology gets better and our studies uh, continue to improve, we might be able to predict previous exposures uh, all the way back to the prenatal period, but also early in life potentially. So I want to tell you about another tissue that we're very uh, interested about, which is the nasal metallum. So these are nasal cells. Uh, we started collecting them before COVID, uh, back in I believe 2016, uh, before you know nasal collection was pretty standard. Well, it's pretty standard nowadays. So why do we study the nasal metallum? Well, it's in direct contact with the environment. So we're really interested in air pollution and that's what we wanted to see, right? So a lot of the gas exchange comes through your nasal passage and we're interested in air pollution. So it makes a lot of sense. Most studies have been studying leukocytes or blood, which of course is an inflammatory tissue, but you know, it'll be more interesting to look at target tissue. It's also fairly accessible. Uh, if you wanted to collect respiratory epithelial cells, you have to go into the lung, which we have done in adults, but in children, you can imagine that uh, probably parents wouldn't consent to that. Uh, so we did a study. Uh, also, this is a prospective bird cohort uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. The median age was about 13 years. Uh, we have about 500 participants, and we profiled their epigenomes with the microarray that I just mentioned to um, getting close to 900,000 individual sites. Um, what I wanted to mention is that we sampled the nares. So we collected at the nares, and we did some piloting about uh, collecting the inferior or superior the, the turbinates, but the issue is, is, you know, it's not pleasant to get sample at the turbinates, uh, especially for children. So we selected the nares. You get less respiratory cells. You also get some squamous cells that are in the nose, um, but you get a pretty good proportion, about 50% of the samples should be respiratory cells that, you know, should reflect what's happening in the lung. So, when we looked at different phenotypes, this is an enrichment of different pathways. So the signal was very strong for allergic asthma. So children with allergic asthma had multiple differentially methylated um, um, uh, regions and genes. Increasing uh, excel nitric oxide uh, was also very similarly associated with the same pathways. And the signal for non-allergic asthma, just asthmatics, uh, children that had asthma that did not have allergy was slightly different. What was really interesting is that the neutrophil degranulation pathway was differentially methylated for allergic asthmatics and also with increasing excel nitric oxide, uh, which has been shown to be a causative factor in pulmonary disorders. Um, signaling by interleukins, particularly 4 and 13, um, was differentially methylated, so the entire pathway um, also showed up uh, as, a, as a significant biological pathway, which is a central regulator of IgE and airway, airway hyper-responsiveness. So, that was also really interesting to be able to, um, to capture the disease process in the nose and the nasal metallum of these children. Now, I wanted to introduce the concept of epigenetic aging, and this is something that we've been studying in terms of uh, biological aging in early life. So if you think about how do we keep track of age, right? When someone asks you how old you are, we report a chronological age, which is basically how many revolutions we have completed around the sun. But there's this common conception, right, that maybe, you know, some people age at different rates, depending on how much you exercise, your diet, how you manage stress, uh, things like alcohol consumption and so on. So, of course, the aging field has very, very interested in telomeres, and you probably have heard of telomeres. Um, but if you tell me your telomere length, I wouldn't be able to tell you your age. Uh, we want to have, you know, very accurate biomarkers, if possible. So how do we keep track with a biological calendar? Well, telomeres are one way to do this, uh, but now the field is moving to these omic based clocks. And uh, this is an epigenetic clock developed by Steve Forbat at UCLA. It's multi tissue. Uh, so here's Leonardo da Vinci's Matruvian men. And you can see that you know, he's highlighting that there's multiple, multiple clocks across multiple tissues potentially. What he did, he trained a model to try to predict um, uh, chronological age based on epigenetics. Uh, this is a key plot. This is the methylation age. Um, predicted using machine learning. And then here on the y-axis, you have the chronological age. The error rate of this clock is about three years. So you're able to kind of predict someone's age with reasonably expectation uh, throughout the life course, all the way from zero to 100. 
of course, when you zoom in into one of these windows, you see that there's a deviations. So what we're really interested in is in those deviations. Why are some people biologically older? Why are people bio biologically younger? And I'll say a little bit more about this, but you know, now this is being used for like crime scene investigation, right? It will be really useful to know the age perpetrator of a crime if you're able to get DNA. But there's other applications that perhaps are not as, uh, as altruistic, and I'll talk about that. So we asked the question whether um, allergy and asthma had an influence on epigenetic aging with the hypothesis that children will have accelerating aging. Our hypothesis was partially supported. Um, so here we have uh, children with asthma that also, this is an allergic asthma phenotype uh, sensitized to IgE. Uh, children that had asthma that had allergic asthma were on average about 1.3 years older compared to children with um, not asthmatic children. Total IgE was literally related to epigenetic aging as well as IG, environment specific IgE sensitization. Uh, and also, just not the allergic asthmatics, but the children with asthma, non allergic, had also accelerating epigenetic aging and also increasing uh, excel nitric oxide was linearly associated with epigenetic aging. We hypothesized a better lung function, right, measured by FEB and FBC. If your lung function is better, maybe your biological age is younger. That was not supported by the data, but I think. You know, these children have pretty well managed asthma. Uh, they all have insurance and uh, pretty good insurance too. Uh, that was one of the requirements or how we recruited for the study. So I think um, if you were to do this in adults, the story might look different, right? The better lung function hopefully is correlated with younger biological aging. Okay, so I want to conclude uh, going over more epigenetic aging clock research. And I think this is, uh, we've been able to convince, for example, the National Institute of Aging to give us a little bit of funding to study um, the determinants of these clocks early in life with the hypothesis that some of these trajectories are set either prenatally or by early life events as, as children develop, and that these trajectories then set you into a course into you know, health and disease. Um, so the clock that I showed you was the Horvath pan tissue clock. So this tissue applies, uh, this clock applies to multiple tissues and it works across the life course. After this, now there's multiple clocks that have been developed, what we call second generation clocks. Some of them are more accurate. Some of them only work in blood. Some of them only, are only for uh, specifically calibrated for children or vocal cells. So people have been developing with different goals in mind. Uh, there's two clocks that we've been working with, which are the gestational age clocks. Uh, so it's basically to try to predict the gestational age of birth instead of chronological age. So to have a higher degree of accuracy, if you will. These are the night clock and the bowling clock. Um, this is data from a prospective birth cohort in the Salinas Valley of California, the Chamacos birth cohort, in which we try to predict chronological age based on, ep on the epigenome of core blood. And you can see here that Boleyn's clock is doing fairly well. It's not, the correlation is not as impressive as the um, adult clocks, but 0.67, that's, that's pretty good with a median absolute error uh, of about five days. So that those deviations on average is about five days. Um, so we have characterized the performance of these clocks. Uh, this is work performed by a student when I was at, at UC Berkeley, so I heard that Elia, she was really interested in programming um, uh, fetal programming uh, from maternal exposures of these clocks. So she looked at maternal triglycerides, lipids, preterm delivery, parity, and infant sex. And uh, with the more accurate clock, we got pretty consistent evidence that increasing triglycerides, lipids, uh, preterm delivery, and parity decrease the epigenetic aging. Uh, so this is a marker of immaturity, if you will. This is the way we're thinking about it. In adults, Increase in epigenetic aging has been the risk factor. That's what people have been hypothesizing, and that's what's correlated with mortality and morbidity. In children, what we have seen now is that things that are known to be adverse uh, for uh, infant outcomes, things like increase in maternal triglycerides, lipids, and so on, are, are correlated with deaccelerated epigenetic aging as a marker of um, immaturity. And it's worth to note, I didn't go into the de de details, but the acceleration is calculated as a residual from the gestational age or the chronological age. So this is completely independent of the actual chronological age. If you do, if you were to try to plot the acceleration measures, which are here on the x-axis against the actual chronological age, it will look like a cloud. There's no correlation by design. So the fact that preterm deliveries are showing increased or decreased epigenetic aging as a marker of maturity is reassuring for us at least. 
One finding that really struck us is that out of all the social factors that we looked, income has an effect, uh, and others have reported this, so maternal income has an effect on the infant epigenome. We have followed these children to age 7, 9, and 14, and we're now collecting more data at age 18 uh, from the prenatal cohort. Uh, children of mothers that work in the field during pregnancy had accelerated epigenetic aging pretty much uniformly across different clocks, and these clocks are designed to, cal to measure different things. They're all calibrated to measure chronological age, but they're, some of them are more associated with morbidity and mortality. So it was pretty remarkable that at age seven, moms that's uh, uh, prenatal maternal field work was associated with increased epigenetic aging of these children pretty consistently across clocks. And I have not seen this for other exposures, even smoking, that I usually think about smoking as one of the exposures that is pretty harsh. Uh, we have not seen this. So there's something about this. We're looking into whether it's pesticide exposure, right? So these are um, farm workers that are working out in the field, whether it's, of course, the, the amount, the, the strenuous labor um, that they perform. So uh, I think this is one of the social determinants or labor factors that might be associated with epigenetic aging of the, uh, um, of the next generation. So that was pretty interesting. Um, so we have also studied ACEs. So of course, I don't have to tell you too much about ACEs. Uh, you probably administered this uh, uh, in, in your practice, but you know these are uh, self-reported adverse childhood experiences uh, that we collected. And we collected this from the mom. So by design, everyone that enrolled in the study had to be 18 years or older. Uh, and they reported on ACEs. And of course, ACEs are zero to 18. So hypothetically, right, all of these ACEs are preconception. So before conception happened, reported by the mom, and then we looked at epigenetic aging of the children. Of course, this is a little bit controversial, as I mentioned, because this is indicates the hypothesis that we're trying to test is that there's some acceleration of the clocks that is uh, through generation. So it's from the mom, not prenatal, but preconception to the child. Um, after birth. Uh, so that's the hypothesis that we're trying to test whether ACEs accelerate epigenetic aging of the child uh, uh, later in life. So this is the data that we have from the Chamacos cohort. Remember, this is the Salinas Valley. Uh, well, we did find evidence that, you know, ACEs, um, unfortunately, is quite high in the, in the study cohort. About a quarter of uh, expecting people reported um, having three or more ACEs, experienced three or more ACEs. And this was pretty consistent uh, among the subsamples at age seven, nine, and 14, uh, about 25% uh, the estimate throughout, throughout the three study visits. Um, so this is work performed by uh, a postdoc. He's now a faculty member at Emory, Dr. Jamaji Nawaji Emran. And he was really interested in testing um, the effect of ACEs on epigenetic aging later in life. What he was able to document is that indeed, Increase in ACEs was associated, or like three or more, two or more ACEs were associated with epigenetic aging of this multi tissue clock that I mentioned earlier. Um, so he was able to dig into the 10 domains of the ACEs to see which one it was that was accelerating epigenetic aging. And I thought, I thought, you know, before when we met, I told him, I think it's probably the physical abuse or mental abuse. I think those are pretty traumatic events. And we were surprised to see that it was actually in our data, divorce was. Um, the, the one ACE domain that was driving this association, so parental divorce um, of the mom, right? Uh, or not the mom, but as reported by the mom pre preconception. Another finding is that we found pretty consistent associations with accelerate or, or increase in telomere length. So this is estimates of telomere length at seven, nine, and 14 years of age. Um, we thought it was, you know, hypothetically, if you're accelerating aging, telomere length could be decreasing. But interestingly enough, increase in telomere length has been associated with cancer, which is one of the findings from the ACEs literature. And we're finding evidence here that uh, the telomeres are uh, of exposed individuals are longer to per compared to unexposed individuals. Um, so uh, this is a little bit, you know, uh, we had a, have to go back and forth with the reviewers. We have to pose multiple uh, hypotheses. Maybe these are permanent socioeconomic conditions, although we try to adjust for things like education, SES, uh, household uh, support and so on. So I think we adjusted for a lot of the social factors. So whether this is true, transgenerational transmission um, is yet to be determined. Um, what I wanted to end the talk a little bit about the misuse of some of these biomarkers. Um, 
I, I just have a snippet here of a quote from a CEO of an insurance company. They're actually using the epigenetic clock to try to risk stratify people for insurance premiums. So he said, what we're trying to do is like precision medicine, but precision insurance instead. So basically, they're taking a bulk of cell sample, estimating your epigenetic age, and risk stratifying you based on your epigenetic age. I have met providers and also people that are doing this. These are people, of course, insurance is not reimbursing people for this, but you can go online and order these kits and measure your epigenetic age. I'm not saying people should. I haven't done it myself. I don't know how much more information that will provide beyond you know, some, um, some of the information that we already have and what you, you would do about it. But my point is that I think we're running into a lot of ethical issues here, how this is used. It's very unclear whether GINA, for example, the law that protects against discrimination for uh, genetic information, covers epigenetics. As I mentioned, things like smoking influence the epigenome. So people have tried to argue that epigenetics shouldn't be covered uh, uh, under GINA. Insurance companies are using it uh, now to risk gratify people. Um, there's a lot of uh, the industry in health and wellness are also using some of these clocks uh, to try to give patients back information as well. But I think it's dangerous, as I just showed you, there's both environmental and psychosocial factors that might influence epigenetic aging, and which are the populations that are going to be affected uh, by some of these decisions of trying to use some of these biomarkers to either risk stratify or uh, to, um, to provide or not provide different services. So I think it's a somewhat of a dangerous path. I have proposed that you know we shouldn't be doing precision insurance. We should try to do precision environmental health, at least for what I do to try to slow epigenetic clock ticking rates. I'm really interested in trying to design studies to test interventions. Uh, we actually have a study from with a colleague from Florida. He's, he's testing a parenting intervention. So this is an intensive uh, parenting intervention with kids that are at risk uh, with behavior problems um, to try to see if the parenting intervention actually reduces epigenetic ticking rates uh, among at-risk youth. Uh, we want to reduce harmful exposure. So I want to try to understand what are the things that accelerate these clocks and can we actually do something about it? And how can we optimize both the prenatal and the early life environment uh, to really give children their best chance? So I think this is the way that we can use these novel biomarkers. I am a little bit concerned the way they're potentially being used and misused um, now uh, as well. So just very briefly, I think in summary, what I wanted to convey today is that epigenetics is a very useful biomarker. I may be a little bit biased, but it provides a lot of insights into mechanisms, but it can also provide biomarkers as well. A lot of questions that I get sometimes is like, well, what about the other omics? Like we have done RNA-6 studies and so on, but you know, the, the sweet spot of methylation or some of these epigenetic marks is that they're fairly stable. Once a condition established, and like, for example, with smoking, they stay out there and they stay out there with a sense that you can actually predict uh, smoking. Um, epigenetics for biomarker development, I think the epigenetic clock is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is because the effect of aging on the epigenome is pretty apparent and we have the tools now to, do, to, to try to measure it. But I think as we keep getting better with our technology, we're going to develop more biomarkers for other things as well. Um, and this is what we're trying to do, as I, as I mentioned with my colleague, is trying to use epigenetics to, um, to target interventions and prevention, also to monitor whether interventions are working. This is an issue with the field of aging, right? Whenever they do a study, there's always a question, is like, well, how do you know it worked? Because you cannot follow people for decades until to see who dies and who doesn't those studies have not been performed. So they're always looking for biomarkers to see if an intervention actually worked. And I think this is a good, a good start. Uh, and finally, I, I don't have to tell you this, right? Because a good start will last a lifetime, but you know, I'm really interested in optimizing the prenatal environment. Um, we study endocrine disruptors, things like metals, lead and mercury as well. And I didn't present those data, but if you are interested, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to, to work on some of the fellows as well. Um, with that, I just want to thank the students and postdocs. So I have a wonderful team. I was at UC Berkeley before, so a lot of these, uh, the undergraduates and the PhD students remain there, and some of the postdocs are, are now here at Stanford as well. I've been fortunate to work with multiple bird cohorts. I presented data today from Gen3G from Canada, from Project View in Boston, and Chemacos here in the Salinas Valley, and uh, lucky enough to also be funded by multiple NIH grants uh, to do some of our work. And, yeah, with that, I'll be happy to, to take any questions and hopefully have some more uh, of a discussion with the remaining time.
All right, thank you, Andres. I, I think it's really obvious why Melissa and I were so excited about recruiting Andres here as really a joint uh, partnership with epidemiology and pediatrics. You know, during your original presentation and also during here, I was jotting down lots of things where, oh, there's a, there's a project with endocrinology, there's a project with GI, there's a project, but obviously, you know, so much of what's already happening here, I'm thinking, for example, of SPHERE, this big U grant with Stanford Precision Health for Ethnic and Racial Equity, all kinds of operations to bring this into that work. Um, really, really exciting. I think one thing we were really um, excited about the possibility is our fellows, we now have mechanisms now for our fellows to get master's degrees in epidemiology. And I as can imagine in every single one of our subspecialties, there's going to be some really, really exciting um, opportunities and sort of disease specific. You touched on allergy and immunology and asthma, and then also the prematurity. So just the possibilities are endless. So I hope all of you will think about the opportunities within your own divisions. And Lisa, obviously the Office of Child Health Equity I'm sure you can, the, you know, the possibilities are limitless. Okay, so not surprisingly, we have some great questions to kick us off. Um, all right, from Fernando Mendoza, if you haven't met Fernando, you need to meet Fernando. Um, we will make that happen. Your data from Salinas for farm workers would suggest Latinos may have faster aging, yet Latinos overall have longer lifespan than other groups. Might you suggest that risk might change over time? Yeah, I think this is, Definitely an interesting uh, point about, I think this is the migrant paradox too, that some migrants fare pretty well when they come to the US. Um, but it is, you know, this, this population, specifically the Salinas population, uh, these are all farm workers. And I think, you know, it's pretty well characterized that are, they're at risk of uh, exposure to pesticides, um, um, also disadvantaged conditions as well as an, an adverse environment. So I think we're dealing with, with a population that is definitely disadvantaged in, in many ways. And I think we're just capturing at least the farm work, the prenatal farm work piece was really interesting to me because I think it encompasses probably multiple domains uh, that we're trying to disentangle, whether it's the pesticides, whether it's the social conditions or whether it's other adverse conditions. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get to that soon. Um, all right, there's lots of data in this lecture, so pardon me if I missed it, but what's the correlation between epigenetic age and age at death? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Actually, epigenetic age acceleration as defined as the residual, so completely taking away the age, the effect of chronological age, that is more predictive of time to death uh, than chronological age itself. So people are using it for risk prediction for that reason into, uh, for insurance companies, as I mentioned. But yes, it is a stronger predictor of time to death compared to chronological age itself, which is one of the strongest predictors of uh, time to death as well. All right, there's an abbreviation in here that I don't know. You know what that is? Oh yeah, the mother gene. Is okay, so can you comment on role of MTHFR on human health? Mm -hmm. So I think they're talking about methyltransferases perhaps. Uh, yeah, uh, perhaps I can clarify, but I think it's metal transferases as well. Um, yeah, and I think this is something that we're studying uh, metal donors like B12 and folate, not only for the prenatal period, but there's a lot of interest in trying to optimize the epigenome. Recently, there have been new developments in trying to um, program the epigenome using CRISPR and Cas9, the same way people are editing the genome uh, with the hopes that there's less off-target effects that you're not truly altering the genome, you're just altering the epigenome. And B12 or uh, other uh, metal donor supplementations might be able to offset the off-target effects of uh, epigenetic editing. Lisa, Hi, um, Lisa Chamberlain. Equity. Yeah. Uh, super exciting and so wonderful to have you here. One of the issues around public health is we have a hard time with precision, right? Some people can smoke their whole lives and do fine or eat bacon every day and do fine, others not so much. How close are we to being able to start to say and potentially even use in a pediatric practice, looking at kids and saying you would be more resilient around X or you would be more resilient around Y? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how close we are to that. Uh, or you know, what would be the area where we might start, like with asthma or mm -hmm. uh, some specific conditions that have high prevalence? Yeah, and I think this is where the biomarker piece might help us, right? So let's say epigenetic agent makes it into the clinic one day, and that may become standard part of a panel. There's no reason why it shouldn't, and the costs are coming down and down as, as we go on. I think that can be an opportunity to try to understand if someone is biologically older, understand why, 
um, and this is what we're trying to do the research to characterize this. Um, I think the reason why I think the epigenome is promising is because it's somewhat malleable. So when people stop smoking, actually the changes start reverting uh, in a systematic fashion to the point that you know how long they quit, you know, how long ago they quit basically. Uh, so I think that's really promising to have a biomarker that is somewhat liable that way that you can actually see time since quitting or time since they initiated smoking as well. So to monitor interventions, to monitor treatments perhaps as well, like with the asthma example that I show you, you know, are the treatments working in the short term as well? But yeah, that's, I think that's a great question. Yeah, well, that's a great point because the next question is, can epigenetic aging be reversed? Is that very powerful? Yeah, well, I don't know if, uh, how many of you have uh, kept up with this, but um, there was a, they founded Altos Lab, which is basically this research enterprise to study aging. And part of it, I think Jeff Bezos gave up the first round of funding in the order of billions of dollars. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to understand what can reverse genetic aging. There was a good example. Uh, uh, there was a paper only in 10 men, middle-aged men, and they used human growth hormone and they were able to reverse epigenetic aging. I'm not suggesting that anyone should be using <laughs> human growth hormone, but they were able to at least see an effect, I think with six months of treatment uh, up to a year later, they reversed the clock for about two to three years. Whether, you know, I don't think the epigenetic aging should be the holy grail that we're trying to pursue in terms of modifying aging, but I think it can be a useful biomark. But yeah, that's a pharmacological example. And there's now trials, people looking at lifestyle interventions to, to see if that can, you know, exercise and diet could reverse epigenetic aging too. Great. Do we have a question? Hi, yeah. I'm Kylie. I'm one of the PEDS residents. Um, I've done a little bit of work with one of the former residents here um, about positive deviance inquiry around school readiness and positive childhood experiences. And I know you touched a little bit about it at the end of your lecture, but can you talk a little bit more about um, looking at the correlation between like positive childhood experiences and epigenetics? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm glad you bring it up. I know the ECHO Consortium, the Environmental Determinants of Child Health, uh, you know, they're pulling a lot of cohort studies from the U.S. to try to look at this. That has be become a huge focus on like positive child health experiences. We personally have not, uh, you know, I feel responsible that I'm always bringing gloomy news in terms of chemical exposures and climate change. And I think this is an area where we can actually try to find positive experiences, as you mentioned, or things that we can actually intervene in the right direction. Uh, but yeah, I personally haven't. As I mentioned, the parenting intervention that I'm working with in with my colleague in Florida is one example. And we're seeing some evidence that the intervention group has the accelerated genetic aging compared to the standard of care that the psychologists usually provide to the families. So at least there's some potential evidence that that might be working. Yeah. Thank you. All right, great. That seems like a good note to end on. So with that, oh, did I miss anyone? No, nope, I think we're good. All right, well, thank you everybody. It was a wonderful conversation yeah. and welcome.